Hey everyone, I've had a ton of requests on the channel to reveal and show my personal production and mixing template. I have kind of demoed it in a couple of videos but haven't gone into how the template works. And that's what we're gonna do in this video. I've heard your comments, we're gonna get into the template. I've been working for the past 10, 15 years as a professional producer and mixer and mastering engineer. And this is the template that I have refined and edited and improved. It's the foundation of all my work. I begin every single song in the template. I also mix all of my clients' work in this template. It's called the Lightspeed Production and Mixing Template. And I call it that because it bakes in a lot of routings and submixing structure that allow me to work flexibly, quickly, and create extremely professional sounding results. When you're a producer or an engineer, time matters, efficiency matters. And so having a starting template that is able to give you all of that uh, in terms of results is a, a great idea. I couldn't work without this template. There's a link right below this video where you can download it for free. It will remain free. And currently it's uh, for Ableton Live. I'm gonna be showing you inside of Live. It's available for a few different versions of Live if you don't have the most current one. But don't be afraid if that's not your DAW. The concepts that I'm gonna be teaching you can be applied inside of Logic, Cubase, FL Studio, Pro Tools. All of these DAWs can do the types of routing that is required. And in fact, I've already had a couple of templates built for other DAWs, like we have one for Logic already. So stay tuned down in the description. I'll let you know the DAWs that are available and I'll update that in the description as we build more. What the game plan is today is I'm gonna open up a completed mix that I've just done of a real project and everything was built in the template. So what you get with the download is the blank template and I'm gonna walk you through exactly how I've used it in my own production and mixing process. I'll walk you through step-by-step, step, show you exactly how to do that. You can use it for starting songs. You can use it for mixing your client's work or your own work, or you can use it to take a project that you've already written outside of the template and import your stuff into to be able to level up your track, your production. All right, without further ado, let's get into it. So here's the project all spooled up. I'm just gonna play a little preview through the first drop. So there's the project. If you like that mix and you want to know how I did that mix start to finish, that's my next video. So stay tuned for that one and I'll show you step by step exactly how I did the entire mix on this project. But for this video, we're just focused on the template. And I want to say if you've downloaded the template that you get from Warp Academy, it's a blank template intended for you to be able to start a new song or to import your music or your client's mix into. And we're looking at a full completed song here. So I just want to explain some of the differences that you might observe if you're using the blank template. So the blank template has placeholders for you to put in all of your different types of instruments and audio material. This project is going to look really similar, but any areas where I didn't need that type of sound, I've deleted it and I've added in maybe a couple of extra instruments here that weren't in the original template. So the template's intended to be flexible for you to add and remove things as you need for your type of music, your genre and whatnot. The other thing I'll say is that in the blank template, there are gain stages down. There's a negative 16 dB utility device. It's just a gain plugin in Ableton Live. You could use anything that does gain for this if you're in another DAW. And it just basically, there's no magic thing to negative 16. It just knocks a ton of level off of sounds. And the reason for that, I go into in another video, okay? Uh, it's called headroom gain staging and clipping in 32-bit digital audio. I'll put it in the cards and the link to that video in the description. And it explains why I gain stage everything down a ton before starting a project. But you're not gonna see those in this project because this is a completed uh, project basically at this point. So um, 
those are the, the main differences that you might be seeing if you're kind of confused and you're looking at the blank template versus what we're using here. So what is the deal with this template? Let me walk you through it. We're gonna start from the bottom and work our way up. So you'll see that I've got groups here for different types of sounds, okay? And the way I organize everything has a kind of rhyme and reason to it. I start with the lowest frequencies at the bottom and the highest frequencies at the top in all of my workflow. So you can see I have the 808 at the bottom, which is really the sub, and then I have bass, which is uh, layering on top in some cases of the 808, and it's more of a mid-range element. Then we have drums, vocals, and then these are like synths and instruments. These could change from project to project. I have crescendos, synths, water sounds I used as a special effect, and then effects up top, which includes things like white noise primarily, uh, maybe crashes and stuff like that. Occasionally I might put uh, impacts in there, which is a lower frequency sound, but I kind of group the effects like that. So... Yeah, and you'll notice that I've color-coded everything. Um, I'm OCD like that, but it really works for me, and I found that it works really powerfully for other people too because anytime you open up a mix, a project, an old project especially that you haven't been in for a little while, you can immediately, it just helps with the visual acuity of locating things. So I always know inside my projects because there's consistency between them that I know how to go directly into a sound. I can't tell you the amount of time that it costs you to be disorganized when you're a professional. You know, if you're just a hobbyist and you know you do this on weekends or whatever, like maybe that doesn't matter to you. But for me and a lot of other people, we do this day in and day out and minutes and seconds matter. So if I go into a project and it takes me 30 seconds to find the sub because it's called Audio 47 and I have no idea what that is and I have to go solo things and hunt it down, that's frustrating for one, takes me out of the flow state when I'm working and it just costs a lot of time that's unnecessary. So I just do the same thing every time. Subs and low frequencies are purple, basses are blue, drums are red, and then inside the drum bus, there's, uh, I'll show you those in a sec, vocals are always pink, and then synths and instruments are green and, and uh, lighter blue, and then the effects up top are white. That's just how I do it. You could come up with your own color structure, it's no problem. And uh, you'll also notice that all of these main sounds, all of these main groups are labeled in all caps. And that is very intentional because a lot of times when you go into the routing areas and let's say like you want to throw like a sidechain compressor on something, right? So like if we go ahead and we grab a, a compressor and you need to route something into the sidechain input, okay? So you're looking at a... Uh, just a huge amount of tracks, right? Now, notice how everything in all caps really stands out. Yeah, well, that's why I do this. So anything that's in all caps I know is a, a group or a bus or a collection of multiple sounds. And anything that is not all caps is an individual instrument. Okay, so that just really, really helps me out a lot. So that's uh, naming convention stuff, how I work. And again, it comes down to consistency and speed. So uh, yeah, Let's just go uh, group by group. This could easily be called sub. Um, I call it 808s here because that's uh, the project is kind of a hip hop inspired psychedelic bass music song. And uh, that's uh, what I got holding down the low end. So if we solo that up. Nice. And then inside that group, I've got a couple of different sounds. So there's a, a high passed saturated 808 that's used in the breakdown. And then there's this layered accent bass, I call it. Sounds really mid-rangey when you don't sum it with the sub. Yeah, right on. Uh, um, pardon the clicks and pops if you hear that. It just sometimes happens when screen recording with projects like this, especially in sub where you start and stop DAW transport. So just bear with me on that. Uh, yeah, so then we go up and next is uh, basses. Now... You may just have one track called, or one group called bass. Uh, if your project is more simple and if the, you have like a bass guitar or something and that's what there is in the bass. But in a lot of my stuff, I'm layering sounds. And a lot of times I have like a sub and then I have like a bass that sits on top of it as a layer. And uh, that's, that's what this is in here. So I have this uh, bass sound that layers on top of the 808 in the drop. Here it is in the mix. Okay, 
So that's what I would consider a base. And then I have uh, here, there's in the second breakdown, there's also uh, a base. Nice. Okay, so let's get into the drums. So the drums contain everything, everything percussion oriented, uh, the full drum kit, uh, any kind of drummy effects, toms, crashes, everything is in this group. So you can see I, I kind of have these reverse uh, snares and they're leading into the main snare. There's like that. So if we sum that with the snare. So it's just like a crack. Um, and I really like that. I use it for special effects. And then I have, these guys are just a, a drum rack that are breakdown drums. Neat feedback delay on there. I'm using some some dope sound toys uh, effects for that. So stay tuned for the next video on mixing this project. So I'll show you exactly how I did that. I have a reverse kick. Yeah, I, I'm not going to go into detail on this because that's what the next video is going to be about. It's going to be about how I did this mix, how I did the sound design. Uh, but basically, yeah, uh, they're just separated into kick, snares and claps, and then hi-hats and high percussion. And um, I always label my kick in red, my mid-range stuff, percussion, snares, claps, toms in orange, and then high percussion, hi-hats in yellow. So those are all getting summed up. Uh, there's not really much for vocals in this project, as you imagined. I might, I don't know, I might see if a vocalist wants to rap on this or something like that. I don't know. I haven't, haven't, it's not a totally complete project. It's just in the final stages of mixing. And uh, I certainly don't rap or sing. So uh, I kind of left it open, but I did put in, I like to use little snippets of vocals. So that's where I just use this little guy here. All right. So that's the only vocals that are going on in the project so far. And then we have uh, special effects. So I am a big fan of using reversed renders of audio. So I typically run them through a big reverb and then I render that to audio. I reverse the reverb tail, delete the dry sound, and then I use the resulting crescendo as a way of introducing new sounds and uh, build energy to do buildups rather than dropping in some type of like riser or reverse symbol from a sample pack. I find this just sounds more classy. It's pulling sounds from the song itself. And in particular, it is really, really good for introducing new, new sounds. I use the sound into a reverb and then render that out, reverse the tail. Yeah, right on. If you guys want to know how I do it, my reverse reverbs, it's really simple, but uh, maybe I'll do that in another video. So, uh, yeah, these are all the individual parts and, uh, I'll just sum this up. Now you'll hear that's pumping, right? I'm running it through a really neat tremolo effect from sound toys and that's giving it that quarter note pumping feel, which I also really like gives it a rhythm. Nice. All the pulsing that you're hearing on that, by the way, is ducking to the drums. And that's something I'm going to cover later in the video. Uh, so whenever you hear elements like that, that are like kind of fluttering in a, in a weird way, it's because the drums are attenuating those using a ducking structure that I'm going to show you later in the video. So that's why it sounds kind of, kind of weird like that when you solo it. Okay, next up, synths. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of melody synths in this project, and that's what these are. So if you have uh, pianos or horns or whatever, you can put them all, just add audio tracks. The template has these placeholder audio tracks, right? So they're just intended for you to either drop audio onto um, or drop a MIDI uh, track in there and have an instrument on that. So any of the tracks that you see in the template, they're just placeholders for you and you'll see them in this structure. Uh, it may make sense for you to like if you have a lot of horns to do like a horn section so instead of calling it synths you'd split that out and you'd bring in another one called horns right or maybe you have a lot of strings so again the structure is flexible you just duplicate and rename things or add tracks or groups in as you need and uh, really a lot of the magic comes in up top here when we finally get to the submixing structure okay so yeah yeah here's i'll just play some of them for you here's all the synths Oops, those are routed in a way where I need to solo them individually. Yeah, there we go. Right. 
Right on. Pretty self-explanatory. All the all the mid-rangey synths are, are there. If they're not a bass synth, then they go in there. Uh, this is the only one where I think I added this in that's not in the template already. This is just a special effect that I wanted isolated. And um, it's actually an audio recording of me paddle boarding. It's the paddle going through the water. And I love just using little bits of Foley recordings or field recordings in this case uh, to add some spice into the track. And uh, here is what that sounds like. Yeah, there's lots of effects on it. You kind of get the idea. You can hear that's a paddle going through the water. Uh, yeah, so that's what that is. And then effects. Nothing too crazy going on for effects. I have uh, white noise. I, I use white noise in a lot of projects, um, a lot of times in place of like crashes. Uh, when I'm doing electronic music production like this, uh, a lot of times I don't like to use crashes. I find them, they can sound a bit cliched. And um, I use white noise instead. It's a bit more controllable. And so I have these neat white noise bursts. So again, that white noise is pumping, and uh, that's because of this little beauty right here, the Tremolator, which is actually a super deep, very configurable, powerful plugin from Sound Toys that I'm using a lot in this project to get all the sounds to pump. So that's where that's coming from. And then I just have this little effects reverse. Yep, there we go. So that's all there is in the effects. So there we go, bottom to top, and just a little refresher. I put my lowest frequencies on the bottom, I put my highest frequencies on the top and then I label anything that contains multiple sounds with all caps so it's easy to find. And I have my own color coding structure. You know, this is what works for me. You may find something else works for you, but uh, this is how I've been doing it and refining it over years and years. And uh, it really works for me. Anytime, especially I need to open up an old project or I'm uh, needing to, to navigate to something quickly and I don't know where it is, this helps me to find it like that. So now let's get into some of the real heart of the magic of how this template works. And this is the submixing structure. So what are submixes? You could call them buses. I like to call them submixes. They're basically uh, mixes that are smaller collections of different sounds, levers that you can pull on. And uh, I've had a lot of people say, well, why do you use submixes? Why don't you just use, you know, groups or folders? Every DAW is a bit different in, in how it works, but a lot of DAWs are able to just group tracks together like uh, these things below like this here since drums this, these are group tracks in Ableton Live and they do bus audio through them but I'm bypassing those in most cases and I'm routing the individual audio out into these submixes and there's a few reasons why I do that one is that whenever you need to export stems, which is actually pretty common if you are uploading to Beatport and you want to do a stem mix or you're just doing anything, it's it's quite common to to be able to need to export stems. Well, you can just take the key stems on here, the key submixes, solo those, do your exports, right? You can export very easily. And again, regardless of the project that's underneath this, when you have the submixing structure, all your stems are always called the same thing and they're always consistent from project to project, okay? So that's one. Um, if you're doing any type of immersive mixing, Dolby Atmos, Apple Spatial, again, sending these out to a mix engineer gives them the flexibility to be able to place elements in that mixing process. But really, the two biggest reasons why I do this is it gives you extra layers of control, and I'm a big fan of incrementally adding effects and, and extra layers of control, and it simplifies the final mixing process. So once I'm done kind of the rough mix and I've got the mix really where I want it to be, this is something where I just go up and I start working with the submixes. These are a bit more macro moves, like maybe just all the drums need to come up together or the bass needs a little bit more compression. It allows me to kind of commit to the underlying mix as it is and stop fussing with it because we all know that that can be a dangerous rabbit hole to get down. So all the effects that are underpinning the mix are just there. Everything's summing up and I can just listen on a bus level. What are some of the final changes, the more, the more subtle changes that I need to be making on each one of these individual groups of sounds? And so I, I love that. I love that it just focuses my energy on what really matters. And I'm just doing nudges at this point. So when I'm in the final detailed mixing phase of a project, I'm typically working only with these submixes rather than digging down and potentially getting distracted with individual sounds. So uh, now let's take a look at uh, 
at the submixing structure. Now, this might make your head spin a little bit. Um, it's gotten more complicated the more I've worked, especially working as a professional. But I want to give a little shout out to um, my friend Luca Pratolesi. He's a Grammy Award winning engineer, also runs Studio DMI in Las Vegas. Many of you will know him. But uh, he's the one who I learned this structure from. I've adapted what he does a little bit for, for my workflow. But really, I want to give Luca huge credit for uh, showing how he organizes his stuff. He, he teaches online. You can find him on YouTube and at mymexlab.com. And uh, wow, I mean, the guy's just a genius. He's uh, at the top of the industry. He won the 2024 Grammy with Skrillex and Fred again and Flodan for the song Rumble, which was the Grammy for best electronic slash dance recording. And he works with Diplo and, and uh, many other artists. Um, yeah, so he really knows what he's doing. And, and this is really an exemplification of how a professional works. So this is how I started to work. And once I did, it, my mixes just got, got better, cleaner, more flexible, and uh, definitely allowed me to work more, more quickly. So yeah. Um, let me explain. So anytime you see the dark gray and there's a little indent here, that means that these are items that sum into one of the other submixes. So again, starting from the bottom up, we have this submix eight, which is called base and 808. And underneath it, the submix base and the submix 808 are summing into it. Okay. If you want to see what's summing into what you can see, uh, here, this is the output of the track, right? And that is sending out to submix base and 808. And then this has been set to monitor to the track input. And so it's going to listen to whatever's there. And then uh, each one of these submixes sums up to something above it. Okay. So that's the structure. A lot of times I, I collapse these guys underneath like that. So you can just see what's the, the main submixes. And then uh, here, it'll start to make sense, right? We've got kick. These are submix all uh, summing up to submix seven. So the other thing I've done here is I've called them submix 7.1. So that's another way that you know that's summing up into submix seven. So these are components of submix seven, which is all drums and perk. Okay, so we have kick, toms. You'll see this is yellow because there's nothing routed to the toms. I didn't use toms in this track. So therefore that's blank and it's not being used. Snares and claps, low percussion. Uh, again, there's nothing here that is actually routing to low percussion. Low percussion is something I might use for like hand drums, like congas, bongos, and things like that. Some people might route toms to some, a low percussion group, but uh, I usually, if there are toms in the track, they have a really specific chain on them, and so I, I leave them on their own. High perk, and then that sums up into all drums. Okay, same thing uh, with everything moving up from here, all mid instruments. So this would be instruments, that would be for me things like uh, pianos and and keys and and strings and stuff like that. Uh, BG synth stands for background synths, so these are pads and and things like that that are intended to be set back in the mix. Then we have lead synths, pretty self-explanatory, and then all of those sum together into the all instruments group. So this gives me a layer of control over like everything that's a mid-range element in the mix. Okay, and then we have here. Again, I said the, the vocals are not complicated in this. This would be much more extensive if I had like vocal harmonies, doubles, a rapping part, a singing part. This would be this would be really beefed up here. But in this case, uh, I just simplified it into BG, background vox, and lead vox. And in this case, really, there's just that one sample that comes in. So I think I just routed that to, to all vox. You can see these are both yellow. Um, so if we go, we take a look at the vox, you can see here it was routed into... Um, I actually wrote it that straight into the mix bus. Yeah, cool. So I'm not even using this vocal group here because, again, just the one sample. Okay. So then we go up to effects. All of those effects from the group below are routed through the effects submix. All returns. Okay, this is a really, really critical one for you to get. If you are interested in mixing for clarity and loudness, because it is totally possible for those to coexist, uh, you want high fidelity, quality, loudness in your mix. You need to group all of your return tracks together. You can't just let those go to the master where they normally go. And the reason for that is you need to duck them, okay? If you want your limiter to behave on your master, if you don't want your track to sound like a distorted mess, every time a drum comes in, then you need to be ducking your time-based spatial effects, which are typically what's in the returns, to your kick and the snare and your main drums, okay? So in this track, you heard it, I have a lot of pretty lush reverbs and delays and things like that. Let's just take a look at what I have 
in the returns. So I'm using these two different reverbs here for early reflections. That's just to control kind of the acoustic space, the sound of the acoustic space. I have a big plate. It's super plate from Sound Toys. I have this thick and widen group. I have an Echo Boy, big long delay. And then I have a Pro R2 from FabFilter that's running a really short, uh, small kind of room ambience. And uh, all of those uh, are critical to group together. So those are all, yeah, if we look at see where these are going, you can see audio two is going to submix three all returns. Okay. Now, if you do that and you're in Ableton Live and you don't touch anything else, you're going to get mad latency. And it's just a, a weird glitch bug in the program. And uh, so what you actually need to do is once you do that grouping, you need to go through every single track in this structure, right click in this area and go, disable all sends. So I have them disabled already, but they look like this. You need to right click and go disable all sends. And um, that's a critical part of the process because it gets rid of the latency. And I'm talking like it's like 40, 50 milliseconds of latency. It'll, it'll act like it's a delay and all of your return tracks are going to sound completely out of sync and, and total rubbish unless you do this. Okay. So I've already done this in the template. You have to go track by track. It's quite time consuming. In the template, I've done this. Okay. So you don't need to worry about this. But if you go and you add a new track in, right? Like this, you can see that new track is not going to have its returns or rather its sends disabled. So you're going to need to go who like this and disable the sends. Okay. Nice. So that is the um, structure up to this point. Now you'll see I have this ducking structure. Why on earth, Drew, do you have three different types of ducking? Okay, well, let me explain. So Submix 2.1 is hard ducking. So ducking devices, whether you're using a sidechain compressor or some type of enveloping tool, you know, in this case, I'm using uh, Devious Machines Duck for all of my ducking in this project because it's really, really good. I think it's the best of the plugins out there that do this. When you do ducking, it can become quite noticeable, especially on mid-range and high-frequency elements like white noise and uh, synths. And you may not want that hard ducked sound because it can actually really uh, mess with your perception of uh, rhythm and and uh, if you have your like white noise in your project and the white noise is like ducking to like a broken beat kick drum or something like in this project it, it just sounds weird it sounds really weird to me i don't like it and so i have hard ducking which is where i send all the elements that i want absolutely out of the way of the kick and snare so that would definitely be the 808 and any other low frequency sounds for sure and then other things that I want to knock out of the way more fully. So it's a much more aggressive ducking um, group here. Just to show you what I'm doing, again, in video two following this one, I'm going to go into all of the settings here and why I set this up like this. But you can just see what's happening. This is a little overlay of the kick, uh, and you'll be able to see uh, the 808 coming in via the sidechain. Right? Right? So we can see what's happening is when the kick is absolutely at its max, this is at its lowest. So it's it's ducking it out of the way. I have a multiband on and uh, you can see the amount I have is at 80%. I'm not going 100% with this because I didn't actually like how that feels. A lot of times I do go 100% in the hard ducking group. And then I have different ones set up for different types of snares and the enveloping is different, okay? But again, that's for another video. Soft ducking as the name implies, is for things that I want to maybe duck the low end out of, but I want to leave as transparent as possible. Um, vocals could go in here. I usually don't duck my vocals at all, but if it's like a stabby vocal effect that's summing with one of the drums, that can cause the mastering limiter to distort. I've had it happen on a ton of projects and with my clients' work and things like that. So sometimes I do actually want to duck the vocals to the drums. It's usually not the lead. It might be harmonies or background vocals or vocal effects. But there could be other things too. If there's a lead synth or if there's like a horn in it that you really want to be prominent, but you need it to play nicely with the kick drum so the kick still has enough headroom to punch through that and it's not getting masked by that element, then I just use much gentler ducking here. And again, it uses a kick, a couple for the snares. One is a snare, one's a clap. And I'm enveloping, you can see, you know, I'm just being more gentle in the high end and I have the mix down a bit. So yeah, these 
are ways that I can just be a bit more light touch on stuff. And then there's uh, HF ducking. That stands for high frequency ducking. If that wasn't obvious. And um, that's one that I added in more recently. I used to do just hard ducking, soft ducking, but then I started to have a lot of these like white noise and higher frequency effects in my projects. And I would start to hear the ducking, even if it was soft ducking. And so I, I decided to, uh, for the fidelity of the high end elements, the noises and things like that, I decided to create a HF ducking group specifically. And you can see here, um, I'm only using ducking to the kick. I'm not letting the snares duck the high frequencies here. And this just gives me, again, it's layers of control flexibility within your, within your process, okay? Now, you can see the all returns are routed to the hard ducking submix, okay? So all those long, splashy reverb tails, those are all getting knocked out of the way to the drums. And that's a critical pro move when it comes to getting fidelity in your mix. Otherwise, those things can get, can, they can get masky with the drums. They can, they can just start summing up and creating overloads and, and making your limiter freak out. So you really, if you're going to have the lush, long reverbs and decays, you need a way of controlling and ducking those. And so this is one of those have your cake and eat it too techniques where I'm like, yeah, I want a lush sounding, big sounding track, but I also want my drums to be right up front in your face and super clear. And I want my mix to sound really clean and punchy and high fidelity. Well, this is one of the ways that I do that. Okay. So then everything below is all summing up into Submix 1, the mix bus. Now, why don't I just have this going to my master? Well, uh, this allows me actually to print my mix inside the project. And this was a technique, uh, shout out to David Nazi from Mixbus TV. Uh, he is who I learned this from. And I, yeah, I used to just route everything to the master and call it a day, but now I actually route this to Mixbus. And uh, it just allows me if I want to, to, to put effects on my mix rather than having them on the master out or in Ableton Live, they call it main now. I don't know why they made that change. Master, it's a master. So um, I do have a couple of these racks here that I want to explain. And uh, this one is called Pre-FX uh, VCA Utility. And this is called Post-FX VCA Utility. And all these are is ways of pushing gain um, in the mix. So let's say you want the chorus or the drop of your mix to be like, have some extra oomph. Well, it's really common to automate that up. This is where I do that. And I have uh, this is done if I want to do it into any effects I have on the mix bus. So if I have a compressor or a saturator or a limiter or a clipper or dynamic EQ, or whatever, this precedes that. So they go in the middle of this sandwich. And so it's a really different sound if you want to automate your mix up into your gain reduction effects, right? They're going to they're gonna squish a bit more. You're going to get a more compressed, tighter, uh, more contained sound. You might want that. You might not want that. Sometimes it can be much more impactful to automate the chorus or the drop of your entire mix bus up after the effects that are on it. So this gives you the flexibility to do either one of those. And um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't ever do more than 3 dB. I put 3 dB of range in there just to restrict it so you have finer control. And that's that. So there is the entire submixing structure. Um, ask me questions about this, you know, drop me. I love hearing from you guys. So drop me questions below in the comments. If any of this doesn't make sense, if you want me to explain the rationale behind these things a little bit more, I'd be, be happy to, uh, do my best to clarify things for you. So the perceptive amongst you will notice that there is a final area to explore up here called references. And, uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. These are my mixing references. So in this case, I've been using uh, childish Gambino sweatpants, suicide boys, Carrollton, um, a Taiga tune. And, um, the way that this is set up allows me to listen to these without the references going through the effects that are on my master. Cause if you look at the master, you can see I've got a, a, a light mastering chain on here with a clipper and a limiter and things like that. So I do not want these references going through the mastering chain and distorting my perception of what they actually sound like. So what I've done here is they're all grouped into this references uh, group here, and they are bypassing the master by going to external out. So that's a function of Ableton Live. 
Different DAWs might handle this differently, but what that does is it sends it right to the output of the DAW, bypassing the main or the master track and any effects that are there. And then I have them turned off like this so that if I want to listen to them ever, what, back to back with my song, I could just press the solo button, I'm listening to the reference, and then I release the solo button, and now I'm listening to my mix. And of course, there's plugins that do that type of thing for you, but why buy a plugin if you don't need it? I don't really use those uh, plugins uh, to load references into. Uh, I, I do it like this, which is a bit more simple, and hey, it's free. So that's it. And then uh, you see on each one of these, I just have a utility, and that is so I can adjust the volume of the reference track to loudness match with where I want my mix to be. I use it sometimes, I don't. A lot of times I just have the reference tracks and I'm mixing and mastering my song until it's loud, as loud as the references. And other times if a reference is like over compressed, maybe a little bit, sometimes sometimes references are like really, really, really loud and I don't wanna go that loud, um, then I'll, I'll knock some level off them using that utility. So that is the uh, structure of the references group. And you can just create tracks in here. You can throw as many as you need. You know, I usually use two or three of these in each one of my projects. So I have placeholders in there for you on that as well. And uh, yeah, if we look at my master, in the blank template, you will find on here a utility that's pushing up 6 dB. Okay, I want to explain that for a second because you don't see it here. I've removed it. And I tend to mix um, by gain staging everything down at the beginning. And that's what all those negative 16 dB utilities throughout the whole project are for. There's to get everything, lots of headroom in the project. Because if you start adding in like sample pack stuff that's pinned, it's mastered, it's going to be zero dBFS, right? So you add a couple things that are zero dBFS together and they're already clipping your master. So you want everything nice and low. And also I find throughout the mixing process, as you're balancing things, you, you want a lot of room to turn things up because let's say your kick drum in your song, it's just a bit too quiet. You want to turn the kick drum up. Well, if you're redlining your master, like a lot of people work, uh, I think it's a bad way of working. Then how do you address that? Do you, do you just push your kick drum into a clipper or a limiter harder because you need the kick drum to be louder? Well, maybe you don't want it to be more clipped or more compressed. Maybe that doesn't serve the sound. So just driving everything harder into a clipper, I think is a ridiculous idea and something that causes you to actually lose fidelity and go into garbage loudness territory with your song. So it's actually... Once you get to that point where you're redlining everything, well, you got to turn everything else down if you want a perceived loudness increase in your kick. Well, if everything's really quiet to begin with, you have a ton of room just to keep turning things up, turning things up. And I find that that's why I, I start with everything down really quiet. But um, I also want headroom. If I'm sending the track out to be mastered, even if I'm mastering it, I want, I want just a little bit. The negative 6 dB thing is, uh, I addressed that in, in the video that I linked you to before, the, the uh, headroom and clipping in 32-bit digital audio. I talked about negative 6 dB FS. Really all that matters is that you have a little bit of headroom, a little bit of room to export so that the mastering engineer, if they're working with it, knows that the track isn't clipped. Like, Do not normalize your export because it looks the same as a clipped um, over 0 dB render, right? So uh, the reason why I have a, a plus six utility on the master is it forces me to control gain in the mixing process. So if I'm mixing and all of a sudden the master starts to flash red and I'm clipping the master, then I go back into the mix and I'm like, what's causing this summing problem? You know, what do I need to address or compress or limit or, or nudge around, duck, to get rid of that overload. And then when I'm done the mixing process, I can just bypass that utility on the master and I magically have six dB of headroom. It doesn't need to be a plus six dB. I just like having room, lots of room, okay? Headroom is, is important to me in my process. So that's what that's there for. You can adjust it to whatever you want. You could have it be plus 10, you could have it be plus two, you know, whatever you want to end up at and your final render with a little bit of headroom is where you want to set it. Right on. So uh, there's the template. Like I said, drop me questions below. I know this has been a big, long deep dive video, and I really want to commit to answering anything that isn't clear, clarifying things. So yeah, drop stuff in the comments. Let me know what you thought about uh, this process, and I'm happy to uh, respond with uh, any clarifying information I can. Whew. Deep dive complete. I hope you got a lot out of that one. Remember to grab the template, free download from the link directly below the video. Now, 
In this video, I showed you how all the routings work and the best practices that I'm using in the template. But a lot of people have been asking me about details regarding my full mixing workflow. Well, that is a whole other deep dive video, but I'm not going to leave you hanging. I have shot, produced and released that already as a part two follow up for this. I will drop a link right below this video. Click that. It'll take you to part two and I'll see you there. As always, let me know in the comments what you thought about this video. Please subscribe to the channel if you have not yet already. Give me a thumbs up if you liked it, and I'll catch you on the next one. Take care.